but um, if everybody could, they're probably getting to that part where they're a little bit tired now. If everybody could stand up for a second. I got a little exercise that a guy showed me one time. We're going to get this group in energized. So, okay, everybody, what you're going to do is you're going to take your hands and you're going to go one like this and one like this, but you're going to do it as fast as you can and we're going to go for 30 seconds, okay? Ready? Go. Faster. Come on, you can go faster. Faster. Let's go. Keep going. Come on. All right. That's good. Woo! Now we're going to feel, it's going to energize you. What that does is that releases some endorphins in your brain, and it's just like drinking a cup of coffee, but you didn't have to do it. So, um, I, yeah, see, everybody's ready to go. All right, yeah, see, there we go. All right, so we've got some great uh, guests, or uh, speakers, as I said. Um, today, we've got Jonathan Ewell from the city of Austin, Texas. Jonathan is the uh, senior videographer and uh, producer, editor. Um, we've got Letty Bizzardo Matthews. Letty is a uh, writer, producer, photographer, editor, and I'm sure the list goes on and on and on. Uh, great storyteller. And Chris Vogt from LMCC, Lake Minnetonka Communications Commission. And he is a excellent uh, uh, producer. He's got great uh, uh, acolytes. He's got the Emmys and, and lots of things under his belt. And then we've got uh, John Giamberso from the city of Seattle. If you would like to, yes, <laughs> go John. And if you would like to um, read their rest of their bios, it's on the app that Natoa has. Uh, I just want to, we have a lot of stuff. We're going to go really quick. We'll save questions for the end. And it is a different format than you're used to. These speakers are going to speak twice. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to Jonathan and get out of his way. Jonathan Ewell from Austin, Texas. <laughs> All right, anyways, I'm Jonathan Ewald with the uh, City of Austin. Go ahead and put up the first picture. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk to you about uh, shooting the 122nd cadet class, which is our Austin Police cadet class. Up here, we have two cameras. This is what we use. We have an XD cam and an HDV. Go ahead and go to the next picture while he does that. So basically, those are our main cameras that we use to shoot anything at the City of Austin. We also got this 5D, which we're just trying out. So. Go ahead and bring up that second picture. And we wait. And there it is. All right, so go ahead and go to the next picture. <laughs> and there, there's the HDV camera right there. All right, anyways, those are the kind of cameras we use. You, you don't have to show any more pictures. Uh, let me just go ahead and you can go ahead and start to bring up the first clip. Uh, so this was a very, very long eight-month cadet series that we filmed the whole thing, nights, weekends. It kept going, which seemed like forever. Uh, but first, um, before I get into kind of the characters, I just want to show you the very first day. So go ahead and roll the first clip. Yeah. There's 70 different personalities, and there's 70 individuals in this group and somehow you've got to get them where they're thinking as one group rather than 70 individuals. We're all just waiting and the anticipation is always the worst part. It definitely lets you know that you're not in Kansas anymore. So, what? so he goes in there and he's calm at first and all of a sudden just an ex cacophony of Screaming. Get on your feet! Curse words. We're just gonna show up and do whatever the f we want. We got other people showing up and lived in Austin, Texas for a f year and still don't have the right address for their driver's license. Guess what? You're showing up to work at the police department and you're violating the f law. People are afraid of fighting. People are afraid of confrontation. And as a police officer, you're gonna have to be comfortable with that. Grab your water bottles, get the f outside right now. Okay, there you go. That's the first day. So that's what basically uh, James, go ahead and stand up, James. James and I, who you all met this morning, we had uh, basically tried to capture all of this. Uh, so go ahead and you can go ahead and start bringing up a second clip. Um, basically, we, we wanted to have three characters. So we sent out note cards on that very first day. Uh, three people signed up. And this is basically There's our character. Some of the cadets probably aren't going to be ready. Yes, sir! There's one of them. There's one of them. 
problem with me? No, sir. You got a problem with my sergeant? No, sir. He Never is mind. a very no, tough, go, 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 tough, go, go, tough go, go, teacher. Go. That's uh, Sergeant go, 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 Trujo go, 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 from the Austin go, go, Police Department. Go, 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 So anyways, what you're seeing is Cadet Jones. Cadet Jones was one of our characters that just was all over the place. And basically, you're going to see all this. I feel that when people that come and try to be police officers just because it's an application they put in and it worked out for them, that a lot of times you may not have all that it takes. There she is in the ambulance. Every day. I don't want to make the okay, you're good. You can go ahead and turn it in. Anyway, so basically we had three characters. One, you just saw Cadet Jones. We had another Cadet, Sakamoto, who was in the Air Force, and then Cadet Bohannon, who was former UT Police Department, which is our University of Texas. Anyway, they all signed up. So we went through oh, probably three or four months, and she just started kind of going downhill. And at this time, we were starting to collect those interviews to try to get this all cohesive and put it all together. So. Basically, when we would call her, she wouldn't call us back because she didn't want to do any of the interviews. So it's getting around. You can go ahead and bring up uh, clip three. So it's getting around like uh, probably month Get three. This is Cadet Jones. Watch out, watch out, watch out. No, 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 watch out. You guys got to communicate. Let this turn lane go. Step out of the way, Jones. Step out of the way. Get out of the way, Jones. Stop. Go. Stop. Anyway, uh, yep. Jones turned go. out to be a very, not a very good police officer. So, so now we're, we're, we're struggling. We're struggling. We have three characters, two of which we've gotten an interview for, and the third character is now falling apart on us as, we, as we're trying to, you know, pick up the pieces. So go ahead and pick up uh, clip four. So basically, go ahead and pause that for a second. Basically, uh, we kept trying. We kept trying to get interviews with her, and finally we had to push... Uh, one of the sergeants that oversees the cadet class for her to give us a sit-down interview. Well, basically, that didn't happen. And the next week, we got there, and we found out she was kicked out. So now what do you do? Your story's totally gone. And then she also sent us an email that said, do not use any of my interviews. So now we're thinking, oh my, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're, you know, we've only got two characters. How are we going to tell this story? So finally. Uh, they allowed us to use the footage, but not the interviews. So this is how we remedied that situation. Go ahead and play. What I've seen a lot out of the um, the female instructors is they um, they're not going to cut those women any break. They don't want to cut them any slack. They expect the exact same out of them as out of the male cadets, and that's what we all expect. And Jones had some mystique around her because she would be called out mysteriously at times throughout that, that entire month prior. But then they, somebody else comes in with a box, and they take her bag, they take her nameplate, put it in the box, take her stuff, put it in the box, take her bag, and walk out. Now there's an empty hole where she sat. And again, we may be new cadets, but we call that yeah, a clue. So we're like, oh, okay, it doesn't look like she's coming back. We all wish the absolute best for her. There is something that called her into public service. Now, she was uh, a jailer in Travis County, I believe. Um, and, and her skills that she picked up there actually helped a number of cadets. She has a good heart, it seems. She has a heart and a desire to do public service, which not a lot of people do. Um, whatever issues she may have had, uh, or, or, or whether they be weaknesses or, or whatever, you know, I wish that... Okay, you can go ahead and turn down the volume on, on that. Uh, that's how we transcend. That's how we... So basically, we, that's, that's in a nutshell how we told her story. We basically showed her, and obviously the clips are, you know, 30 minutes for each episode. So, I mean, I urge you to go check it out. It was, it was a lot of fun work. But basically, that's how we turned it around. We showed her basically getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and then we got to that point. So that's how we salvaged our storytelling. And we did that through making sure we were focused when we were out in the field, making sure we were getting these shots. As trouble started to come to us, we were trying to head it off at the pass and stay ahead of it. So that's uh, it for my first segment, and uh, I'll hand it back to Dennis. 
Thank you, Jonathan. That was great. Um, you did a great job of capturing that. It was a big, big project, and it seemed like it was one massive thing to tackle. Just so everybody, what we're trying to get out of this today is maybe some, some different ways that you can go about shooting, editing, telling stories, maybe a subject that's not the, the greatest subject that you think, but uh, I think these people have a really good creative approach to, to tackling subjects that are could, could maybe be a relatively boring subject, but they have a neat way of telling that. And Letty has a very good talent for, for capturing emotion, and I'll let her explain some of that. Thanks, Dennis. The very first Natoa conference I went to had a storytelling seminar with tips from Al Tompkins from the Pointer Institute. One of his quotes was, people won't remember what you told them. They will remember how you made them feel. So I try to think about that every time I produce a story. Here's an example of how we worked to get to the heart of a story. We were approached by the Tucson Fire Department to produce a video on ATV safety. The challenges were one, how do we personalize it? And two, how do we visualize it? So let's take a look at our approach. We were on a vacation trip to Rocky Point and um, we've always had ATVs, all-train vehicles, and dune buggies, and, and Eric was 11. And he was not allowed to ride the ATV. Um, but my wife had gone down to the, the beach Eric had stayed up at the condo to read his book. And there were a couple other kids there that got on quads. And Eric jumped on and followed him. There was a pickup truck that was going 50 with four locals, uh, workers in the truck. Eric crossed the road, didn't see the truck, and the truck hit him. Eric never regained consciousness and he stopped breathing and his heart stopped just as they were landing in Tucson. Eric was killed 10 years ago. And my life will never be the same. To work on. So let's move on to evoking another emotion, laughter. We've all had to do stories on traffic and courts, right? Yeah? Well, they can be boring, really boring. But we decided our story was going to be fun. So we went out and we shot man on the street interviews, and we asked people like James, what's your best excuse to avoid a traffic ticket? Uh, I have to go to the bathroom really bad. <laughs> okay, lucky for James, we also did a piece on what happens when you do get a ticket, both with a little help from graphics, sound effects, and some fun. Yes, I have gotten a traffic ticket, and my excuse was, but I can't afford it. It wasn't me. <laughs> We bought new tires for the car and they said that they were oversized so the speedometer might be a little off. It was that my mom was on her way to the hospital. Oh yeah, I've heard a lot of excuses. Uh, excuses such as I'm late to my kids plays, to a doctor's appointment, I'm having really bad stomach issues. He tore it up and that was that. He gave me a verbal warning and I got, got to see the opening of Star Wars on time. I didn't get away with it. It doesn't depend on the excuse uh, so much, just, um, just kind of, you know, officer discretion. If you weren't able to convince the officer not to give you a ticket, here's how you can take care of your civil traffic or parking ticket at the Tucson City Court downtown. Now we're inside the court building. If you were charged with a civil traffic violation and not a parking ticket, you have three options. Option one, plead responsible and pay your fine by mail by phone, or on the website. So we 
really strive to personalize this next uh, story. Oftentimes, police officers can be stereotyped as being big, burly, and unapproachable. Well, this one is burly, but approachable. Some might think that Officer Tom Burley isn't someone you'd likely bring coffee as he stakes out his familiar fishing hole trying to catch the big one. But one routine morning, he was, as they say, in the right place at the right time. All of a sudden I saw a vehicle pull over on the other side of the, the road. That caught his attention, but not enough to distract him until the female driver waved him over. She told me that her baby wasn't breathing. Officer Burley then did something he didn't have to think twice about. His lips were uh, blue and he was pale. Uh, and then at that point I, I started uh, CPR on him. <laughs> Gave a couple breaths. And after the second breath, uh, he took a deep breath and began breathing at that point. The thing is, the premature three-month-old infant he held in his arms, whose name was David, was surprisingly familiar. Eighteen years ago, Officer Burley held his own son, a premature infant with breathing problems, by the name of David. Like mine, he was, he was small and now he's 6'4", 210 pounds, <laughs> so... And so the Burley police officer by the name of Officer Tom Burley, with a son by the name of David, and a big fan club by the name of David, made a difference on what was turning out to be just another routine day at the fishing hole. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I have more videos, so please don't go anywhere. I don't want to fall. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Vogt. Um, I would start this out by showing you some of the gear that we use in cameras like uh, uh, Jonathan did, but I don't want you to laugh at me. We, use, uh, we still shoot on mini DV tape and use Canon XL2s. But um, even with that, I st still think you can make some uh, creative award-winning programming uh, that uh, captures the viewer's uh, interest and uh, uh, obviously get some uh, reactions that you're looking for in regards to um, great storytelling and uh, eye-popping visuals. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today first is a ice rescue training uh, and a public safety show that we started producing a couple years ago called First Responder TV. Now before we show the clip, I want to talk a little bit about partnerships and how that is so important to um, uh, do a quality show. Uh, I tried to get First Responder TV launched for about three years at LMCC. Uh, it was extremely hard to do. We are a small organization, but we have 17 member cities, uh, and we have about uh, 10 public safety departments in the Lake Minnetonka area. Uh, basically, if we're going to be responsible for the shooting, the editing, uh, hosting, all those aspects of a show like this, uh, we are going to need a great partner and we got really lucky with one of our local uh, departments, uh, the Excelsior Fire District, and their fire inspector and public educator. Her name is uh, Kelly Murphy Ringate. And the reason I bring that up is without Kelly's involvement, there's no way we'd be able to do what we do, especially when it comes to our ice rescue trainings or any other training aspect that we do with the program. Uh, this, these are uh, highly uh, involved uh, events that take weeks to plan. You're working with multiple public safety departments. Uh, individuals, uh, water patrol, you name it, to put these together. And if we weren't all on the same page working together, it would never happen. It's a little hard to, to plan and be creative if you are running in a million different directions and you have no idea who your contact is and who your support system is. So just in regards to creating quality public safety programming, uh, have a partner, uh, you know, work with them, and that's how you're going to be able to create some of this great programming. So what I want to show is an ice rescue training. Uh, and then a, uh, a little bit of our public safety show, which is called First Responder TV. This is a four-minute clip. The first uh, couple of minutes is the ice rescue training, uh, and then I'll show a little bit of the show. Just briefly, things to be paying attention to with the ice rescue, obviously, that, that you clearly, Jonathan and Letty both had showed in, in their clips earlier, is, you know, 
sound is very important. You know, you're going to hear the crack of the ice, the wind, the, the crunch of the snow beneath the feet. Uh, gnat sound is extremely important for what we do uh, and to really, you know, get the viewer, which is the most important thing in the middle of the action. And our first responders are the stars of the show uh, leading the charge in educating and informing the public. So uh, if we could roll that first clip, that would be great. We have a person that is in the water. Um, it's cold, they're getting hypothermic here. Um, water Patrol has arrived with their airboat. They're gonna try and get the victim out of the water with it. Water Patrol is entering the water. The people on shore here will be talking to the victim in there, trying to keep them calm, keep them alert. Before we ever send anybody in the water, first off, we're always going to attempt to try and throw something or reach something out to try and bring that person in. Once they get him in, then they'll take him to shore to an ambulance that'll be waiting there. We're practicing with water patrol in our own boats to see how this works. Um, their boat is really new for them and our boat's really new for us, so we're, this is the first time we're doing this. We're seeing how they work together. We actually set up a unified command with Water Patrol and our people. They're not even on the premises or right here, but they're sitting somewhere getting a visual picture from our people that are here and making tactical decisions as to how we're going to go about getting people out. The other thing is, is actually getting the, the hands-on work with the firefighters out here to help get the people in and practice their skills out here in the cold weather suits and stuff out in the water. We're training a, a new person as to how, how they work, how to float in them, how to get around in them because it's quite different than uh, just being out in the water normally. Okay, we're going to need some help down here on shore to get him up and out. First off, you should never be out on the ice alone at night. If you get out, after you're in an incident like this, just call somebody and let 911 know that you've gotten out of the water where you are. Within two or three minutes, you're already starting to get hypothermic, starting to not make good sense because it's raining and everything that's going on here. I mean, you, you're you wet, and the biggest thing you got to do is you got to get those that wet clothing and stuff off you and get somewhere and warm and dry. The victim thinks there was one more person, and he thinks they're in the water. I'm Kelly Murphy Rangate, Fire Inspector and Public Educator with the Excelsior Fire District and welcome to First Responder TV, your local public safety source featuring training exercises and safety tips and much more. Here's what's coming up on First Responder TV. We'll take you inside the house burn training exercise held in Deep Haven by the Excelsior Fire District. We'll talk to Dan Bernardi, Chairman of the Governor's Fire Prevention Day at the Minnesota State Fair. Scam Alert. We'll give you an update on scams that have been targeting citizens in the lake area. And everyone's favorite master of avoiding danger is back. The LMCC safety expert stops by to give you some important bike safety tips on Safety Source. Now we'll take you on location to an Excelsior Fire District hot drill. A hot drill is where firefighters can have valuable hands-on training with live fire in a realistic setting. Getting out of time here, uh, real quickly on the ice rescue that we saw a little bit earlier, that was a miserable night. We, uh, we actually uh, were delayed a day, we were supposed to uh, film it the day before, but the conditions were so bad, they were actually concerned that, that maybe too many first responders might end up in the lake themselves and they would have to be rescued as well. And then the night we did it, we were out there on location at 6 p.m. Ready, ready to go. And we're waiting, uh, me and Tyler Rape, who's our television production specialist, waiting on location to do it. And we see the fire trucks coming in. And suddenly they do a U-turn and leave. And then I get a phone call saying they just got called out on a, on a real emergency. 
So what do you do? Uh, it, actually, what this allowed us to do is, is both uh, Tyler and myself uh, were able to walk the area, get even better location, so that when they did come back, which wasn't until about 9.30 that night, uh, we were ready to go, and it probably ended up being the best thing for us in terms of capturing uh, even better uh, uh, footage and, and visuals for that piece. Uh, real quickly, just at the end of that, the first responder uh, intro, uh, you saw a segment called the LMCC Safety Expert. Yes, that was me hosting that. I'll talk a little bit about that later in terms of what the challenges were in creating that and why I had to be the host of that. So, thank you. Hi. So um, in thinking about this, um, the video clips I have are not going to knock your socks off. I tried to get clips that kind of reflect what I go through to try and be as creative as possible. And, and the things I look for that to give myself some space to be creative with, you know, if do I have enough time, what kind of flexibility do I have, and, and who my friends are. So, um, the, and the thing that really uh, I start with is I try and do nothing. You know, you get this, res especially with uh, emergency stuff, it's mostly requests. Oh, we need something about storm drains. But, um, and the, my first instinct is to get a camera, start writing, start thinking about stuff. I try and do nothing, you know, just relax, take a day, and let whatever's gonna come to me, come to me. And, uh, I'd like to stay on this storm drain request. In the morning, I woke up and I had a great idea, but I didn't. I didn't have anything else than when I went to sleep. It was nothing, zilch. So then I went to my next thing, which is, who can I steal this from? Who's got a copy? Who's already done this? Um, I really think that um, creativity is not just about your show, but your approach. So I knew that, uh, uh, King 5 had done a whole series on Take Winter by Storm. King 5 also takes our feeds sometimes. So there's a relationship there. I called them up, and we ended up with this clip, which we used, I think, for two or three years. Can you roll it? Are you ready for heavy winds? Have a flashlight, radio, and batteries for power outages. Report outages and stay clear of downed lines. Never bring a grill or generator indoors. The fumes are deadly. Get a checklist at takewinterbystorm.org. Are you ready for this? All of us can reduce local flooding before it occurs. Just rake out leaves and debris from storm drains on your street. Adopt a storm drain today and keep it clear. For more tips and a checklist, go to takewinterbystorm.org. So dated, but I wasn't going to do anything better than that, you know, so I thought this is a plus, we can go ahead and do it. So um, I say don't be afraid to borrow, to look at other stuff, get your ego out of the way, and get the job done, and I saved a lot of money for the city. Coming up next um, was something we did do, and uh, I think it demonstrates flexibility because we got halfway into the show, and then we decided to change the whole scheme. So let's roll it, and then I'll talk about it afterwards. I'm the safe driver. I watch the cars. I pay attention. When turning at an intersection, watch for pedestrians and stop for them. Drive carefully. Think of the impact you could make. So um, the story behind this is that this was part of a Department of Transportation big deal. Not only did they want an animation, but they had a plan to do regular street signs. So if you drive around Seattle, actually there's one in my neighborhood, you see that drive carefully, think of the impact you could make. And um, they were pretty happy with the animation and they had rolled out all the uh, street signs were gonna be made, so on and so forth. And, we were, and if you think so, if you think about it, without the first part, is actually a little bland. And uh, I really, once I get going, I just wanna keep going. It's very difficult for me to stop. But I thought, you know, this is not enough. You know, it, it's information, 
but we're really not uh, we're really not scaring people or getting their attention. So we ended up taking it back, taking another two or three weeks uh, to do the front part and put it together. So I think that demonstrates is, you know, be flexible, um, take a look at your work as you're going through it, and don't get that narrow focus that, oh, I, I've got my script, I'm gonna do it, and I'm finished. This idea occurred to us you know, um, about three or four weeks before the deadline. So um, I would say be flexible. And lastly, um, this one, uh, I just want to talk about if you don't have the time, you need your friends. I keep a long list of every production company in Seattle and the region. They came to us and said, oh, we just got these great new activated crosswalks. Um, um, can you do a show about it? We had just laid off three people. We didn't have the resources. I said, you'll have to get in line. They said, no, we need it. So I gave them my list of friends and producers. And actually, Dennis loves this piece. He called me up and said, you got to show it. We really didn't have too much to do with it, except that um, that network always comes in handy. So, And I love this guy. This guy is a good example of keeping it simple and delivering the message. So roll that, please. The pedestrian act. In our first scenario, no, you and your family are separated. Hold a minute. Go back, please. So it's that one. Hey, everybody. Street Films here in Seattle. And we've stumbled upon something I've never seen before. I wanted to show it to you. Here we are standing on the road that parallels the Alaskan Way Viaduct, which is below it along the waterfront. And here there's a pedestrian crosswalk, and it's a pretty cool pedestrian crosswalk. All the pedestrian crosswalks I've ever seen is you press with a button to activate it. This one is foot activated. Here's what you do. You want to cross the street, you just step right here on this yellow pad, and then cars should stop in both directions. Lights are illuminated on both sides. You'll notice that not only is the pedestrian crosswalk rim with lights, there's a large yellow diamond that has two flashing lights that signals to drivers that there's a pedestrian in the crosswalk. And so at night, when the pedestrians are harder to see, the lights are easier to see, making it extra safe to cross. So the reason that this crosswalk seems to have been put in is because there's a lot of residential housing on this side of the Alaskan Way. Over here is the waterfront. People probably want to get to and from the waterfront to walk, bike, or maybe come for a bite or go to the ferry. So they thought this was probably a good idea as a measure to not put a full stoplight in here. This is, of course, my hypothesis. The truth could be further from that, but that's what we're going with. All right. So I, I skipped over one because I think I've already made my point in the interest of time. When we come back, I'll show you uh, the stuff from Common Craft. But um, basically, again, it's take as much time as you can, be as flexible as you can, and don't be afraid to use your friends and resources uh, to be as creative as possible. Thanks. Thank you. How many of you remember Bill Suki from uh, Orange TV? Were any man in the session? Okay, one hand, only one person. Okay, all right. He, uh, we contacted him. He had a unique partnership with um, Okoe Fire Department, and he just kind of gave us a little DVD presentation on that. We're trying to get as much variety as we can, so. Um, Abraham, whenever you have that ready, just roll it for me. But they have a really, a fire department that w wasn't even in the same area as them, so um, he'll explain it. I'm going to mention, too, that... The At Orange TV, after we help... Go when w these are all available for for all of you, for all the PEG stations, he's got a whole series of these, you can contact him and he will, you can run them on your channel. They're, so after, if you like them, there's a whole series. He didn't want, he wanted me to mention that. Go ahead. And nonprofit organizations get their messages heard. We have a professional staff of writers, producers, directors, and editors who use their talents to help raise the quality of life in our community through informative and entertaining programming. When we heard the city of Ocoee Fire Department presented safety puppet shows in elementary schools, but could only make presentations two or three times a year, we offered them a solution. We brought their set into our studio, 
enhanced it, and produced nine children's safety videos with the fire department personnel operating the puppets. These safety videos were distributed on DVD throughout Central Florida schools. We also placed them on our website as on-demand videos where the links can be copied and used free of charge. Now their safety information can be viewed simultaneously at numerous schools. Let's view one of the safety videos. Hey kids, I was just telling Smokey how important it is to know what to do if your clothes were to catch on fire. Do you know what you should do? That's right, stop, drop, and roll. And cover your face with your hands to keep the flames and smoke from getting to your face. Now let's listen to what my friends have to say about stop, drop, and roll. Hi kids, I saw a movie last night where a man caught on fire and then ran all around until he burned up. That's the silliest thing I ever saw. Everybody knows that when your clothes catch on fire, running around only makes it worse. The thing to do is stop, drop down to the ground, and roll right onto the flames to smother them. My friends are here with me today to talk about that very thing, and together we're all going to learn how to stop, drop, and roll. Listen close now, cause it could save your life someday. Let's see now. Stop. Okay. Drop. Like this. And then roll around. Oh, hi kids. I'm Stan. And I'm practicing what you're supposed to do in case your clothes catch on fire. I guess it'd be kind of hard to stop and think if you caught on fire. But maybe if I practice enough, I won't have to think about it. Maybe it'll just come to me. The important thing is that you're not supposed to run around. Let me tell you exactly what I'm talking about. Listen here, everybody, I got something to say. A lesson everybody should learn. If you're in a fire, better really be cool. Cause if you panic, man, you sure can burn. And if your clothes begin to blaze, don't you lose control. Just stop. 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 Drop and roll. That's right, you just stop, drop and roll. I said stop, drop and roll. Don't run, but stop, drop and roll. Yeah, stop, drop and roll. Well, let's all make fire safety be our goal. You just stop, 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 drop and roll. We produce programs for all ages and make our programs available free of charge to other government access stations. You can view many of our programs at orangetvfl.net. He'll be getting a few emails and requests, but um, uh, on the theme of safety, we have the safety expert, Chris Vogt. He's going to go back. I, uh, just watching the end of that clip, oh, there goes the chair. Uh, watching the end of that clip, uh, the, the one firefighter was talking about how saw a guy catch on fire and run around and that was the silliest thing. That's pretty much what this LMCC safety expert does on a, on a regular basis on those clips. Uh, let's go back a couple years. I had said when I started to try to launch the First Responder TV, the public safety show, it was hard to get it off the ground. In fact, it, it was going nowhere. And uh, what actually got it started was when I met Kelly Murphy Ringate, who I talked about, who was the host of First Responder TV. And one of her jobs is as a public educator. And she goes to local schools. Sometimes she pairs up with the Red Cross, AAA, to educate kids, um, you know, whether it's firework safety, stranger danger, um, you know, you name it, bike safety. Uh, on and on and on, and that was part of her job to to do that and educate kids. And so we said, well, you know, maybe this is a way to start creating some partnerships and get this public safety show off the ground. So we came up with the LMCC safety expert. Now, how did I get involved with hosting that? Well, we're sitting around one day talking about, well, we want to target children between the ages of six and 12. Obviously, they have short attention spans, like some adults as well. You know, what are we going to do? And you go, well, we got we to gotta entertain them. We got to make them laugh. And hopefully then we can use that then to teach them something as well. 
So we're going, well, what do we, what do we want to do? And I always kind of enjoyed uh, Wile E. Coyote and, and Roadrunner cartoons. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's kind of fun. Maybe our, our host is a little accident prone. Maybe he means well, but he's uh, you know, a little bit clueless. Uh, maybe a tad inept. And Kelly goes, Chris, you'd be perfect for this. <clears throat> so instead of taking offense at that, I, I, I took it as a compliment. And I uh, relished the opportunity. And I said, yeah, that, that's fine. Well, what do we want to do first? Well. One of our cities, uh, the city of Victoria, and we, I mentioned before we have 17 member cities where they, they love to partner with us and have us do stuff, but, but very rarely do they feel that they have the resources on their own to help us out with anything. But I knew that the head of public works at one of our cities was also the assistant fire chief, chief for the Victoria Fire Department. I thought, well, this is going to be perfect. If we can get uh, uh, Troy involved with this, working with Kelly, do this kid segment, maybe it'll take off and go some places and, and we can maybe get this public safety show launched. Uh, before I show this clip, the first one we did was snowplow safety. Uh, it actually ended up uh, taking off and being very popular and this really led to local uh, fire departments, other police, you know, public safety departments saying, well, maybe this has a shot. Uh, the snowplow safety ended up getting over 5,000 hits on YouTube, and it was linked to a lot of the local departments. And if you work in community television without much fanfare or promotion and you get 5,000 hits on something, you're doing pretty well. And we didn't really do much to promote it. Some, some national website on snowplow safety picked it up and uh, went from there. And so we were very pleased with, um, with what the reactions were. And then we ended up doing severe weather, bike safety, you name it. So what I've got here is a little bit of a montage, starting with the first one. And, and you'll kind of get the idea of how the setup works. Kind of starts where I'm going to be the know-it-all, showing the kids what they need to do. Um, something happens to me, I need to be uh, set straight, and the true experts or sometimes the kids themselves end up taking over and uh, you know, showing me how it's done, and hopefully at the end I learn something as well as everybody else watching. So if we could roll the safety expert, that would be great. And now it's time for Lake Minnetonka's favorite champion of safety, protector of humankind, and master of avoiding danger, the LMCC's safety expert. Oh, hi there. World-renowned LMCC safety expert Chris Vogt here. Today I'm in Victoria, Minnesota on a cold, blustery day at the Public Works Department. Now again, as a world-renowned safety expert, it's my job to make sure that you, John Q. Public, is safe during the cold winter months. Today we're going to go over some important snowplow safety tips. Now again, as I said before, I am a world-renowned safety expert. I would never go to the end of this driveway as a snowplow is coming through. Did I just say snowplow? Is that the LMCC safety expert? What's he doing out here? Now let's give our viewers some important bike safety tips. Well, I'm on my bike now and we're about to head out for a ride. But first things first, always protect yourself from injury. Be sure to always wear a bike helmet. <coughs> oh, <laughs> whoops. Uh, let's try that again. All right, that's better. Also, always check to make sure you have enough air in your tires. And be sure to always check your brakes. Make sure to always bring your water bottle. And sunglasses. You always need to look cool on the trails. And some bubbles, just in case you get bored. Welcome to the 2011 Safety Camp for Kids. I think it's well-rounded safety. It's a great, fun atmosphere for the kids. I don't think they even know they're learning. They just know they're coming to a day of fun where they're gonna meet firefighters, they're gonna meet police officers. It's a big day for them and we sneak education in there before the kids even know it. So they're able to take what they learn here back home and to their friends and they actually help us spread that safety message. What we do here at the Weather Service is we're watching the weather to make sure that we get warnings out so that uh, people can be safe. We issue weather forecasts so that people know what's coming up. 
If you're prepared, then you're going to be that much more ready to react when we issue the warnings. Well, I hope you all learned some valuable severe weather safety tips today. I know I sure did. I guess you could say this segment was electrifying. <laughs> Great. Another storm cloud. Oh, well, I've got a splitting headache right now. Well, that's gonna do it for this edition of the Expert Safety. Grandma, are the cookies ready yet? <coughs>Really, I, I have no shame, but uh, uh, those segments are a lot of fun to do. And again, yes, obviously they're cheesy. Uh, they're targeted at six to 12 year olds, but uh, it's okay to laugh at it too if you're an adult and you might just learn something as well. So uh, the, to me, those segments are a lot of fun and uh, I, uh, uh, we uh, plan on continuing to do that and love that that was able to, in a sense, move into the public safety show. And now we've been doing that for two years. So sometimes goofy little segments can grow into something else and uh, create good uh, public safety programming. So, thank you. All right. What are we gonna talk about now? All right, so, again, staying on the basis of trying to be funny, get people's attention in a short time period, uh, I'm just gonna roll, uh, go ahead and roll clip five, and then immediately after, roll that uh, monkey. So go ahead and roll it. Yeah, I'll be there by 11.30. Hello. do it there. So why do it here? Please be kind and careful around our work zones. Lives depend on it. So go ahead and yeah, go ahead and roll that one too. I can't wait to get on the road again. On the road by Austin 311. No actual monkeys were harmed in the making of this PSA, but an intern reconsidered his career choice. <laughs> so, let me show you that intern who is the monkey. Go ahead and stand up. <laughs> Go ahead and stand up, Chapes. There's your monkey right there. All right, so there's, there's two ways that you can tell, you know, a quick, funny thing. So the first one, the jerk, we were tasked with, uh, there was a lot of injuries on the roadway, uh, Highway you know, workers were getting run over, so that was our way of trying to convey, uh, trying not to be aggressive. So we tried to look for something where being aggressive would not be typical. And so I, we were talking, and we figured out, yeah, let's shoot it in a grocery store. Let's do that. So, and then the monkey one, we just wanted to put a monkey in a commercial. So, <laughs> that's the way we went. But anyway, there's two funny ways that you can tell the same kind of public safety and make people laugh, make people engage and, you know, get them thinking about it. Also, real quick, um, I want to talk about just a little bit more about the 122nd. Um, obviously, shooting all that, we were talking about gnats. Chris had a great point. Nat natural sound is definitely the key to telling any great story. So I'm going to show you now exactly how we got that natural sound. Is it on? Did you turn it on, James? There you go. All right, so James is gonna boom me. Where are you going? Oh, public safety. <laughs> All right, so boom me right. Everybody can hear me? So this is pretty much, for the 120 uh, second, this is how we did it. That's all. This is pretty much how we did everything. So it's pretty much 70-30, 70% boom, 30% uh, lav. 
And now this was really difficult for us because basically we had to, you can put it down, turn it off. So basically, uh, it was very hard for us to try to conquer the two. Don't, don't sit down yet though, James, you're not done. You're not done, James. <laughs> so basically, 70-30%. Uh, now the key to this is, when we were shooting the 122nd, he couldn't be right behind me plugged in to listen to what was going on because it was just so chaotic. I mean, one minute we were there, one minute we're over here, we're all over the board. So basically how I had to communicate with James, go ahead and boom, like you're going to boom. So basically I'm shooting, I'm shooting, James is trying to constantly keep attention on me and I'm giving him signals. So I'm like, hey, you're in my shot, go up. So James is struggling, 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 but anyways, I mean, that's how, that's how we get it. And um, basically if I, I heard something good, I would tell him, that way he knew not to move. So basically having hand, con uh, hand signals and eye contact is a big important part, especially when you're booming something like that and he can't hear what's going on. He can't see the shot, he can't see anything. And usually we were like really far apart because they did this on a drive track and I like to shoot uh, very far away. It's called Farkas technique, which I think they talked about on Monday, am I right? Yeah, did everybody go to that Lisa's thing? Good. Um, another key important part of shooting was I couldn't always be on a tripod. How many, of, how many people in here have a steady bag? Show of hands. What is it, four? <laughs> okay, simple, easy thing. This is mine. I've had this for 10 years. I use it on everything, everything I possibly can. 45 to 90 bucks is a cheap tool that you can use. Basically what I use it for, I need to get on the ground shot, I put it on the ground, I get the camera settled on there, it's gonna make it nice and steady, okay? The other thing I use it for, which a lot of people don't know, is you can put it on your shoulder, which will give you an even steadier shot. So those are my two little top tips for that. Um, try to think, do I have, is there a fireworks one in there? Did I put that in there? Yeah, we tried to show that earlier, but I don't think I put it in there. Of course I didn't. Awesome. Good job, me. So anyways, uh, basically, that's one way how to shoot it, how to make it funny, and then also these techniques for booming. I hope that will help. And if anybody has any questions, I've got the boom here. James is here. He can answer anything you want to know. And uh, so that's it. Yeah. <laughs> He'll come to you. So and now, Letty. So we worked on a PSA campaign last summer, and little did I know it would bring my daughter to tears. But more about that later. The idea for the campaign came from Tucson firefighter Bethel Vasquez, who had seen too many preventable injuries and deaths and wanted to do something about it. Numerous times, a child had been hurt, and a parent would run up to him yelling, do something. In that moment, Bethel would feel if the parent had done something, the injury never would have happened. So he created the Do Something campaign to keep children safe in everyday activities like riding a bike, playing around a pool, and riding in a car. He wrote three scripts in English and three in Spanish and gave them to us to make them a reality. Here are the first two English PSAs in the Do Something campaign. Hold on, hold on. Are you okay? Do something. Do something, please. Please, do something. Hold on, I'll be right back, bud. All right. Hey, Johnny's on his way. Brenton! Respond for drowning. Do something, do something, please! Please, do something. So we had one more PSA to do left uh, on car seat safety. 
And at our pre-production meeting with Tucson Fire, we discussed who would be our talent. With a room full of firefighters, I was surprised that no one had a toddler. Well, I had two at home, so I reluctantly volunteered my daughter, Jamie. Now, don't let that innocent little smile fool you, because <laughs> the terrible twos were right around the corner. On the day of the shoot, my husband showed up with the kids at 10 AM, but we didn't finish shooting the other PSAs until 11. And then everyone wanted to take a break. Dennis asked me to talk about challenges and how to deal with them. So Dennis, this one is for you. <laughs> Does anyone know how hot it is in the middle of July in Tucson, Arizona, at noon when we were ready to start shooting? Any guesses? Higher, higher. OK, higher, 15? 115, but it was a dry heat. <laughs> Congratulations. So imagine this. Your spouse is cranky, of course. Uh, the kids are hungry, and they're ready for a nap. And it's time to shoot the PSA. To make matters worse, your daughter, who you volunteered, doesn't want to have anything to do with the talent, the mother, that was going to put her in the car seat. It wasn't fun, trust me. But luckily, my husband and son were there, and they ended up with the roles in the PSA. So everything was going great. Then it was time to smash up the car to make it look like it had been in an accident. So cue the sledgehammer on the windshield and turn on the smoke machine. It looked very cool, very cool, and very realistic. In fact, too realistic. My daughter started crying and crying, thinking her dad and brother had just been in a real car accident. And she wouldn't go with anyone but me. And I wanted to cry. <laughs> but what did I do instead? Well, I did what any mother would do. Do something. Do something, please. So I'm holding her, and I'm shooting with the other hand. And she still kept crying. <laughs> but when I was editing the video, I had crying in the background. But guess what? It worked. I could have cut some of it out, but I didn't have to. And my son, Nicholas, did some ad-libbing of his own go, and had a couple of go, gold coin course. moments that I left in. So, take a look. We're just going around the block. Bye, Mommy. Bye-bye. Do something. Do something, please. Do something. <laughs> Whoa! Hi. Yay, cars. Please, do something. So, <laughs> so, the moral of the story is, when life hands you lemons, what do you do? Make lemonade. Make lemonade. Thanks, guys. give some counter examples. Um, and this first one is the bane of community programming. We all grew up with don't ever put a full slate up on the screen, community channels. You know, we burned those to death many years ago. But uh, in keeping with, you know, what happens when you run out of time, what happens when you don't have flexibility, we got, we got a request, that's the one, but hold it for a minute, um, that um, Seattle has a huge immigrant community, and um, people were dying because they were using uh, barbecues inside their house uh, to heat themselves, uh, keep themselves warm, and they were dying from CO2 poisoning. So um, we had, uh, and because we had to do it in six different languages, the production time was really long. We had to find people who were the speakers. We had to make sure it was right. So. Um, this is just something you can go to in case uh, you run out of time. You can run it now. And what we did in order to uh, get all the languages 
lesson there. We always started with English, and then we went on to the other two different languages. And uh, then we distributed this through the county government. And um, so it's kind of a counterexample. Um, again, don't be afraid even to do the usual. And I'm a big fan of it. Let's keep it up so people can actually read it and get more information. It's pretty tough to come up with all the different languages. Okay, that's enough of that. Thanks for being here. And um, now I want to skip ahead and go to the one I skipped, Abraham. Um, if you could go all the way down to preparing an emergency kit. Um, I have to admit this is that I really don't like gear. Um, I feel like, you know, we have to lug all this gear around and sometimes it gets in the way of the message and uh, it's tough to actually get some really stuff good going, stuff going and, and keep your flexibility. So um, we did a show about Common Craft, that's how I found them, and um, they are using, it's, it's not a new technique, but it's relatively new. It's very flexible, it allows you to get your message out. Uh, the production costs are not that high, and it's, um, it's, uh, I'm really in, enjoying working with them. I have, I'm playing all of their stuff on our channel, so why don't you roll that one? We live in a world that's unpredictable. Without warning, we may have to make quick decisions that impact the health and safety of our loved ones. It's easy to assume that we'll be able to gather what we need when something unexpected happens. But few of us really know what will make the difference. Imagine that your neighborhood begins to flood in the middle of the night. You may have to leave your home quickly or wait until local authorities can provide help. In any situation, you want to be able to take care of your family for at least 72 hours. Having a well-stocked, portable, so and easy-to-find emergency kit will help make Thanks. sure that you have... Thanks. So, I think you get the idea. If you could imagine doing that, with real actors, with real props and real sets, it gets the information across pretty quickly. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you, everybody here. Do we? I'm assuming that we're going to have some questions. If you have questions, please come up and uh, ask them at the uh, the microphone over there. Yes. Um, and so clearly it was emblazoned yeah. across the, right, right. the spot where this was. And mm -hmm. Was there a trade out of any sort? Uh, some uh, prearranged agreement? Right. Uh, Good question. Branding? Right. Um, uh, when we recommended uh, street films, we were in on the RFB process. Um, SDOT, Seattle Department of Transportation, bought this. Um, and we helped them configure the RFP, and then we helped them decide who they were going to go with. And so then, so actually, SDOT has the rights to it. Okay, so SDOT is? The Seattle Department of Transportation. Street films, do they do a lot of these kinds of spots? They do, they're an independent production company. The uh, street films, it is about a street, but they do a whole variety of stuff. So they're not just about streets. Is that does that answer your question? Uh, well, it just seems like an interesting arrangement. That, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just wondered why their company name was allowed to be emblazoned throughout the whole spot. Well, that's part. You know, they we paid for it. I really feel like they did it. They got the credit. We don't have any restrictions about that. As it plays in our channel, we have a downstream. Seattle Channel logo that brands it as being on our, on our channel. But we, we actually import a lot of stuff. Are there any other questions for the panel? OK, go ahead. Uh, uh, there's a lot of real cool stuff that you've done. We've all kind of done 30 second spots and so on. Uh, do any of you market them or have a good relationship to the local broadcasters or the cable companies for local inserts and stuff like that? They get even a larger exposure outside of are there, are the current modern day marketing thing? In other words, you know, do you, do you, are you able to circulate outside the, the uh, portals of your own channel and, and market your, your traditional marketing? I'll, I'll take that. 
the, for the uh, PSAs that you saw, obviously, yeah, those were pushed out to local affiliates and played out through the local affiliates. Obviously, we had to buy airtime to do that. Uh, but everything else we push out through our channel and YouTube or any social media, Reddit, Facebook, stuff like that. Uh, we did the same thing. Um, our local affiliates also uh, played back the 30-second PSAs for us. We didn't have to buy any airtime. Uh, we had a good ag agreement with our uh, local cable company, which is Mediacom, and uh, there was a bunch of um, uh, available 30-second uh, slots uh, on a variety of different cable channels. And uh, because we partner on some of the programming uh, throughout the year, um, they just give that to us for free. So it's basically just a matter of uh, uh, you know, finding a, a, a common solution is by if we help you, you can help us. And that allowed us to get some of those uh, air spots. And so, uh, yeah, we've been doing that for about five years. Any other questions? Let me just, uh, we also we'll have, uh, and this might be important in, if people who are going into franchising, we have built into our franchise agreement that we get $60,000 worth of air time from the cable companies in Seattle. And so that's what we use. Oh, Jonathan, did you just, for the grocery store, do you hand over a check for like 50 bucks and, and just wreck the shelves from the <laughs> yeah. yeah, pretty much, no. <laughs> so uh, basically for the grocery store, there's a big chain in Texas called HEB. Uh, and basically we got through contact through a manager at one of the stores and he allowed us to come in and he kind of picked the day that's like a low traffic day. So we basically had five hours to come in and shoot as quickly as possible. But yeah, we told them ahead of time that we were going to wreck one of the shelves and they were, they were totally okay with that. So, <laughs> which I mean, it turned What's out great. What's the name of that grocery so. store <laughs> for when I have to tape? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, yeah, we, we shot, uh, I think, another uh, another thing in the actual grocery store. Yeah, they were really kind because basically, because we were so fast with our production and we stayed out of the way of their, their clients, obviously, people going to the grocery store, they were really nice about that. And so anytime we call them, we, we, we got really good response and we can go back and shoot, so. Well, if nobody else has got a question, I got a question for them. How do you guys get the, how do you get the, the, I know you get emotion in your stories, but how do you find those stories and how do you go that further distance? Letty, I know you had some very emotional stories. Do they, do they come to you? Do you, how do you get to the heart of that story? I think with that one, we kind of got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, the, I believe he was a captain at that time. Um, he was Captain uh, Randy Ogden. He was the one that approached us to do the story and it was him that had lost his own son. Um, if you watch the full story, he talks about how, wow. you know, he felt the responsibility that if it can happen to him, somebody who has been trained for years, you know, it can happen to you. So. I was going to say, I, I know most of the stuff I showed was somewhat humorous in nature, but uh, when you work with a lot of different public safety departments and first responders, uh, they know a lot of tragic situations, a lot of uh, you know heartache and heartbreak, and so you get to know a lot of people that way. And so when it comes to finding stories of that, it's not all that difficult, and you really are there to help. The ice rescue one, for example, uh, right around that time, uh, one of the reasons what we were doing is we were filming below a, a bridge, and even in February in Minnesota, there can be open water, and there had been a situation where a family was in a car trying to go from one bay to the other, uh, the car went through the ice. Uh, the uh, I think the, the husband and wife got out. Um, their infant child did not. And so uh, that was one of the reasons we did that story. And, and so you're, you're constantly, unfortunately, dealing with those situations. But again, that's where community television and public safety departments can work together to try to create programming that you know, maybe can prevent things like that from happening. Does anybody else have any more questions here? That's it? No? no Come on. <laughs> okay, well, we do actually have, there are more video clips. Letty, I know you got another one that you would like to show. We've got just a little bit more time. So is it, anybody want to see more video? Okay, I see some hands. I had okay, go ahead. The cadet piece, yeah. Right. Why, why three and, you know, why did you have access to the whole class and can you talk about that set up? Oh, yeah, yeah. A little more and how that, that all really came apart in the beginning. 
Yeah. Uh, basically, uh, when I got there, uh, myself and my boss, Keith Reeves, who's at the back of the room, uh, we decided that we really wanted to follow the cadet class. I had worked in the local media, and I had gone and you know got a vosat here or there of the cadet class, but I really wanted to follow and capture the essence and the story of what it takes for these police officers to go through eight months of training. So when we talked to them about that, they really wanted a recruiting video. So we kind of made them a deal, basically, like, we'll shoot a recruiting video for you if you let us have full access to the cadet class. And before I had built up a reputation you know, with the police department and the PIO the police department, specifically working with them in the media. So they trusted me and really let me kind of push the story and where I wanted to go. As far as the three characters, I always go with the rule of threes because pretty soon it's one, two, three, and it's, you know, they're gone. So I always try to keep it to three as, you know, for a story like that because they'll just fall quicker. It's easier to get through pieces and stuff. You know, if there was two, then it wouldn't be as interesting. There wouldn't be the diversity. So that's why it went with three. So basically, how it works is, well, in, in Austin, we do the most meetings. We do a lot of meetings. We do, what, 40? 40, 40 a month? So, try, yeah, 45, yeah, 40, and it 45. keeps adding. <laughs> but, you know, we try to juggle that with the PSAs and the other needs of everybody else. So basically, that was what I had to get done first. So anything for our clients who would be, you know, solid waste, uh, the energy department that we own, uh, stuff of that nature, transportation, I would have to get those done first. So basically, I would have to try to schedule around all the other stuff that I was shooting. So basically, I was working extra hours to try to get this. All within my schedule, you know, I would shift a few hours here and a few hours there. Like if we were working overnight, James and I would shift to, you know, like a 2 to 11 shift or something like that. But we managed, and I mean, it was really hard. I'm not going to lie. It was very hard trying to cover that, but we managed to get it done. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a large scale project, yeah. And uh, the thing that I, I, I want to put out there is when you shoot stuff, be logging that. Because that way, when you go to edit it, like I did eight months later, you know where everything is. You know, you can go through and say, oh, here's a good bite, here's a good bite, here's a good clip. You know, make sure you're logging your stuff. It, whether it's in Final Cut or you actually sit down and type it in Microsoft Word, make sure you log your sound and your nats. So. Rich? I just try to be funny. I just try to make them laugh. If I can make them laugh, then that usually relaxes them and it brings them down to my level and then I can kind of get what I need to get into them to make sure that they you know, do a good job on camera. Do you want um, I think too, we, we also incorporate humor. We try to get them to just feel that, you know, we've got lots of tape, we'll be here all day, you know, don't worry about it, just keep going and going. And, and then, you know, if they're still bad, we just, we just keep, you know, just saying, we're, you know, we're really patient, we've got lots of time. And usually they warm up to us. Once they get to know us a little bit better, it seems to go well. I have one more thing. So basically, again, on the tape, you know, I'll just, <laughs> like, we'll do a few takes, and I'll be like, oh, I wasn't rolling. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, and then we'll laugh, and then I'll be rolling on some other takes, and I'll be like, oh, yeah, I totally didn't roll on that. <laughs> and they'll be like, really? No, no, no. We, need, we always need one more, ex an extra one for backup, right? <laughs> I was really lucky with working with Kelly, uh, Kelly on the show. I had actually known her for five years, and, and early on, no, she very was very much questioning, and is this going to interfere with my job, and I don't have much time, but I slowly wore her down over the years, and uh, when, the, when the show first started as well, uh, she, she was not comfortable on camera, but I would, I would say she'd, she'd go to like the state fair and go to classrooms, and she was known as Firefighter Kelly and do all these great, huge presentations in front of 300 people. But that little camera, that lens, really would scare her, and it was a lot of patience. I mean, her intros would take, you know, in reality, what, maybe two, three minutes of, of time, uh, but we would sometimes tape for an hour or an hour and a half just to get it right. But again, that was going back a few years now. She's, she's really good. Just patience and, and trust, and she wanted to make sure that... Uh, you know, she was not going to look foolish on camera, and, and I kind of tell her, well, why would I even think about doing that? Uh, you would never work with me again, and leave the foolish person to me on camera. So, and, and she was fine with that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I, w I would say make sure that the first time you're meeting this person is not the first time you're interviewing them on camera. Build a relationship. If a new council member comes on, talk to them, get to know them before you need them. Uh, I've been through now, I'm on my third mayor. It's important for them to know you and know what you can do and that they'll trust you before you subject them to the lights and the camera. to add one more thing. We always say, steal that line from, what was it, Vidal Sassoon? If you don't look good, we don't look good. Yeah. <laughs> so. I've got one really quick question before we got to wrap it up here, but who was taping you while you had the kid and the camera? Who found the time? Come on and help me. I had an intern that came in and was doing a behind the scenes story. And so luckily he had a few steady shots that I could <laughs> use. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. I think uh, we, I'd like to thank our panel. Uh, hopefully you guys get some great information from this and you get some ideas for some of your public safety programming and um, some thoughts and they're, they're uh, all available. You can email them, you can come up here afterwards if you had some more questions you wanted to ask them. Um, you'll see them throughout the rest of the conference, but if we could give them a big round of applause. I'd... Thank you. Thank you. Thanks guys, that was fun. Nice job guys. Mm-hmm.